הנפלא, ובכל הנביאים, and all the prophets, ובכל מה שנסתבו הנביאים מאדם ועד סוף העולם. On everything that the prophets have told us, from Adam to the end of the world. So the, 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 committing idolatry is violating not only the Torah, but everything that every prophet of God has ever said and will ever say. Um, and by the same token, he says at the end, v'chol ha-kofer ba'avod ha-kochavim, using the same word, someone who denies idolatry, just like uh, the word before was denying the Torah. Modeh v'chol ha-Torah is someone who's agreeing, who's accepting the whole Torah kula, u'v'chol ha-nevi'im, u'v'chol ma'shen estavu ha-nevi'im me'adam ba'ad sof ha'alam, and has accepted everything that all the prophets have taught us from Adam to the the end of the world. And as I suggested last time, um, that does indicate that in a sense, someone who denies idolatry really is, even if they're non-Jew, is the equivalent of a full Jew, which is actually an interesting uh, uh, idea. Um, just to bring that up in English, we can at least look at it. I won't go through the whole thing again. You see this at the top. That's the first thing on the handout. Uh, it's equivalent to all the other commandments and so forth. So now the question is, what is idolatry? Why has this terrible sin that is, uh, you know, terrible for all humanity, why has it arisen? How has it arisen? What's its source? Um, why is it so important? And um, the Rambam, somewhat unusually in his code of law, goes through a history of how idolatry started. And I'm not giving you the whole of it. It's quite long. It's the beginning of his laws of idolatry, the laws of Avodah Zara. Um, but it's not common for him to start a section of the law with a history of why you need this law. So that itself is interesting. And I think we should be asking ourselves the question, uh, why does he bring this in up at all? Why does he need to go through this history? And takes up the two long halakhas right at the beginning, the whole first chapter. So he tells us in the days of Enosh, and Enosh is one of those minor characters who comes and goes very briefly at the beginning of Genesis, the people fell into gross error and the advice of the wise men of the generation became foolish. Enosh himself was among those who erred. Their error was as follows. Since God, they say, created these stars and spheres to guide the world, set them on high, allotted them to honor, et cetera, et cetera, and it is the will of God, blessed be he, that man, and men, they deserve to be praised and glorified, and it is the will of God, blessed be he, that men should aggrandize and honor those whom he aggrandized and honored. So, just to be clear, idolatry begins for the Rambam, not by people worshiping other gods, but by their saying, well, God created these wonderful things, the stars, basically, spheres, other things up in the heavens, mostly, and we should honor them because that's a way of honoring God, okay? So, the, so it begins with what the Rambam thinks is a mistaken way of honoring God, but not a turning in a, away from God. That is, is the idea that he says arose in the time of Enosh. We'll come back to Enosh in a minute. Um, and indeed seems to be his idea, although as it turns out later on, he, the Rambam actually insists that Enosh himself remained a worshiper of God. So when this idea arose in their minds, they began to erect temples to the of stars, offered up sacrifices to them, praised and glorified them in speech, prostrated themselves before them. That is the clear sign of worship, to bow down before them. Um, this, he says, was the root of idolatry. And then he stresses, the idolaters did not, however, maintain that there was no God except the particular star, which was the object of their worship. Their error and folly consisted in imagining that this vain worship was God's will. Okay, so before we go any further, let's go back a little bit to Enosh. Uh, why Enosh? It comes up repeatedly in this. Every time Rambam tells the story, um, and others say this too, so there's a Rashi, on Genesis 4.26. So Genesis 4.26 says um, Seth had the son Enosh, named him uh, Enosh. As huchal likro b'shem Hashem. So literally, then human beings, at least the way most people would read this verse, then human beings began to call upon the name of the Lord. And if you look in most translations, Jewish and non, that's what you'll see it translated as. But that's not what the Rashi says. The Rashi says that Huchal is a version of chulin or profaning. 
So this is basically when they began to profane the name of God, which is to say, use it for things that are chol rather than kadosh. Apply the name of God to profane things, things that are not God. And you, I hope you can see that that fits quite nicely with the Rambam 3. It's not so much that they worship another God, but they take these non-sacred things, stars, and the Rambam would add later trees, and they treat them as if they're holy, right? Uh, why this reading? It, it, it comes from various midrashim, as you can see at the bottom here. Um, the explanation that I saw, this is not my own, but it makes a sense, is when you think about it, why on earth, earth would Genesis say in 426, the fourth chapter, end of the fourth chapter, then human beings began to call upon the name of the Lord? What, Adam didn't call upon the name of God? What about all the people who came before? As far as the story as we've been told it, says that people have been calling God's name for a long time. So the chol or chul has to be read differently. And so instead, they, the Midrash says it's, uh, it's not they began to, to uh, call upon the name of God, but they profaned the name of God. An interesting read, I don't know whether it's very important or not. I do think that the Rambam needs to tell this story. Um, let me see if I've gotten to the, let, let's, uh, yeah, let's, let, let, let me just say right now why I think he needs to tell the story. And, uh, the story continues into Halakha too, and I'll go on with it then. And then I, I want to compare the way he tells the story in his Mishnah Torah, which is directed to, to religious Jews as a law code, and in his guide, which is directed to Jews who are doing philosophy, and in which, uh, most Rambam scholars, at least in the philosophical world, thinks he, he, he says what he means a little bit more directly. But the story is quite similar. Anyway, why do I think he needs to tell the story? I think he needs to tell the story because it makes no sense to claim that people are responsible for sinning when they commit idolatry if they don't know better. I mean, in fact, later on, that's one of the things the rabbis say, and the Rambam will go along with saying, many people who follow in idolatrous practices, they're not really committing idolatry, they're just, fulfilling, they're just fulfilling the minhag of avotehem, the, the customs of their fathers. Um, but how did that first become a sin? Because God certainly seems to think it's a sin. Only if we are responsible for the mistake of idolatry. So he has to explain how human beings came through a sort of rationally explicable way in an, with an intention that at first was not a bad intention. They're not worshiping these stars because they think the stars are God. They're worshiping these stars because they think God set them up because so there's a way of worshiping God. How they eventually corrupted themselves, right? And of course, the Rambam wants to say everyone ought to be a monotheist. And it makes more sense to say that if you think that everyone once was a monotheist. And I should say the claim that the Rambam is upholding here, which also seems to be the view of, of the Tanakh, that we started all worshiping God. We were all monotheists once. So then the question is, how did idolatry arise? Um, and there actually are some modern anthropologists and historians and so forth, not all, but there are not, not a few quite respectable ones, including secular ones, who think that it is true that some kind of a monotheism preceded poly polytheism. I don't know if that's true or not. I think it's disputed now. But in any case, the Rambam wants to say that in God's good world, we had to start out monotheists. And if we came to be idolaters, something went wrong that we're responsible for. And I think that's why he needs this explanation in the beginning. Anyway, he goes on with the uh, notice in Halakha 1, he, we haven't even gotten to idolatry, we've still gotten just to, this is the root of idolatry, but all they're doing at this point is worshiping stars as a means of worshiping God, right? So Halakha 2, in course of time, there arose among men false prophets who asserted that God had commanded and expressly told them, worship that particular star, worship all the stars, offer to it sacrifices, pour a libations to it, erect a temple to it. The false prophet pointed out to him the figure which he had invented out of his own mind and asserted that it is the figure of that particular star. Then they began to make uh, temple figures and temples under the trees, on the mountaintops, etc. cetera. Um, so the idea here is that the false prophets, which the Rambam 
I think does want to present as rather evil people who are making something up and gaining power over people by getting them to worship it. They have a base again on which to work. People have already made this mistake of thinking that stars and other things like it, but stars at first especially, uh, have a, a, a divine power. And that gives the false prophet material with which to work. Okay. Um, and he, 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 I think, does mean to blame the false prophets, but he doesn't want to blame everybody. The rest of the people sort of come into it innocently and they're misled from what might have been an original uh, monotheism. Other imposters then sprang up who declared that the star, celestial fear, etc., had communed with them and spoken to them, said, worship me in such and such a fashion. So gradually the custom spread through the world of worshiping figures with various modes of worship. Notice the term custom. Uh, the, as we saw last time, the Talmud sometimes says that idolatry is a custom of your fathers. And it becomes a custom here. As time passed, the honored and revered name of God was forgotten by mankind, banished from their lips and hearts, was no longer known to them. The creator of the universe was known to none and recognized by none, save a few solitary individuals such as Enosh, notice he's back here, still worshiping God, even if he gave people the wrong idea to start with, and Methuselah and Noah and Shem and Eber, et cetera. The world moves on in this fashion until Abraham was born. So that is the history of the world from uh, Enosh until Abraham. And it's a world that sinks into idolatry out of what's originally innocent mistakes which manipulative people then take advantage of and turn into a worship of less, less of things, intermediary things, which turns out, as you'll see in a bit, uh, to be the core of idolatry for um, the Rambam. Okay, moving along, I should say, by the way, as I'm screen sharing, one of the things I realize is I don't no longer see anybody's uh, hands or anything. I only see a few of you. So, um, I guess what I'm gonna say is this. Elliot, if you see people who seem to have their hands up, um, could you signal me maybe by putting your hand up or something like that? Otherwise, I'll assume there are no hands up. Okay, so now we get to Abraham, who is of course going to be the father of monotheism for uh, the Rambam as in, in Ju the Tanakh and Judaism generally, or at least the father of the return to monotheism. Remember, according to the Rambam, certainly, and again, according to the Tanakh, it looks like we were originally all monotheists. Um, and um, he will be a hero poised to get, poised, who's the counter pose, a counter, a foil to the story of idolatry so far. So the Rambam tells us that even when he was a child, Abraham began to think, began to reflect, to do philosophy, basically. It's not going to be an accident for that for the Rambam. Abraham is basically a philosopher. By day and by night, he's wondering he, you know, he's a child, he may be an infinite, and what he's thinking is how can the celestial sphere continuously be guiding the world and have no one to guide it and cause it to turn around. That is, he's a, Abraham has already learned all of Aristotelian astronomy and is wondering how the sphere is moving on its own. Uh, he has no teacher, he's submerged in Ur of the Chaldees among silly idolaters of De Kochavim Hatipchim, stupid people. Uh, the Rambam characteristically refers to people who commit any idolatry or anything like it as stupid. He's not usually that offensive, but he keeps throwing that word in, not in this text so much, but elsewhere when he talks about people who, for instance, think that their mezuzahs have magical powers. Um, anyone who treats Jewish ritual objects as having a magical power, he tend, tends to refer to them as stupid. Books of astrology, he refers to as stupid books. So there's a, there's a kind of mental blindness that he identifies with idolatry. And that, in fact, is at the core of why it's the sin that we have to fight against. It's also at the core of why the Torah is directed to taking us out of it. Okay, so he's submerged among silly idolaters, his father and mother, everybody around is worshiping idols, he worships them too, but his mind was busily working and reflecting until he had attained the way of truth, truth, and met. Uh, the way of truth for him, it, for Ra the Rambam, unsurprisingly, is a philosophical, philosophical way apprehended the correct line of thought, kab Now, I picked out this phrase in Hebrew possibly for a reason that isn't 
uh, right, but uh, it, because literally kafat tzedek means the right, the correct line, right? Tzedek can mean just correct, the one that's in the right direction. But tzedek, of course, also means righteous, right? And even in English, we use right for correct and for morally correct, for just, especially in the sphere of law, we talk about things being right. So I may be stretching things, there isn't any clear indication of this elsewhere in this Rambam, but it could be that the Rambam thinks having your mind in the correct line philosophically is also having it in the righteous line, in a line that will lead you towards justice. That might be a drush, but at least I wanted to note that the word tzedek allows us to sort of uh, speculate on that. So the Derek Amet teaches him that there's one God, he guides the celestial sphere, there's no God beside him. Having attained this knowledge, he, Abraham, began to refute the inhabitants of Ur of the Chaldees, arguing with them and saying to them, this is not Derek Amet, what you're doing is not the way of truth. Of course, none of this appears in the Tanakh. Um, the Rambam is putting this in partly on the basis of Midrashim. He broke the images. We all know the story about his breaking the images. We don't just don't usually get this philosophical background to it. And commenced to instruct the people that it was not right to serve anyone but the God of the universe to whom alone it was proper to bow down, offer up sacrifices, and make libations. Remember that the uh, false prophets had been urging people to bow down, offer up sacrifices, and make libations to the wrong things, um, you might think that since what the Rambam wants is for you to think correctly, who cares about the sacrifices? And the answer to that is this last phrase, so that all human creatures might in the future know him. So what's the purpose of worship? It's to spread knowledge. It's to get it into you. To, uh, so the, the right practices go with the right knowledge. Uh, the sacrifices in themselves, it's not clear that they're important, but they are important to spread knowledge. The wrong sacrifices were spreading the false beliefs. The right sacrifices are spreading true beliefs. Um, so the king seeks to slay him. He's miraculously slay, saved, moves to Haran. He then began to proclaim to the whole world with great power and to instruct the people that the entire universe had but one creator and that him it was right to worship. He went from city to city, none of this of course is obvious in the Tanakh, and from kingdom to kingdom, calling and gathering together the inhabitants till he arrived in the land of Canaan. There too he proclaimed his message as it is said, and he called there on the name of the Lord God of the universe. This is his one text from the Tanakh that it does say at one point, Abraham began to call on the name of the Lord. That doesn't say anything about that, meaning that he brought a lot of people to his philosophical ideas about God, but that's how the Rambam reads it. Uh, when the people flocked to him and questioned them, he would instruct each one according to his capacity till he had brought them to the way of truth and thus thousands and tens of thousands joined him. Two things to note here. We'll see this come up also in the guide. First of all, Abraham is a teacher. And his job as the founder of what will later be Judaism is to teach people not to be idolaters, which suggests that our job ultimately may be to teach people not to be idolaters, bearing in mind that not being an idolater is like the equivalent of the entire Torah. Um, and bearing in mind also, I'll just add this in here, that Abraham thought that converts came in under the wings of Abraham under the skirts of Abraham. And by doing that, they become members of the Jewish people. That is, they become Jewish people by sharing the philosophy that Abraham originally taught. The other thing I want to stress, and of course it suggests that we are teachers, fundamentally teachers. We have, there's more, the other things we have to do, but first and foremost, we are teachers of monotheism. Second thing is, well, uh, if Elliot doesn't mind, I'll put this out as a question. Who does this story? about Abraham going around and gathering followers, teaching everybody to be monotheists and gathering a whole bunch of people who become, you know, the men of the house of Abraham. Who does that sound like? Anyone? Does that sound like a familiar story? Jerry, it looks like you have an answer. It's a little bit like Jesus. No, not as much. It could be because Jesus gets disciples, but he's getting people from all over and teaching them just monotheism. Muhammad. And I mean, it's the, what did someone say? Muhammad. Yes, yes. 
And in the Muslim context in which it's working, it's really hard to resist that this is uh, the idea that this is a kind of a, you've got Muhammad, we have Abraham, or uh, Abraham actually did everything you say Muhammad did. Um, this does look, I think, a lot, and going from city to city, you know, Mecca to Medina, back to Mecca and so forth, uh, I think that that's in the background of this story. Um, anyway, so that's what Abraham does. I'm going to move on a little bit because uh, there's a fair bit to cover and uh, time is beginning to move along. Um, the next step is why you need Sinai and why you need Moses. In the beginning of the answer, further down the halacha, because we are, we are, you know, we are all these monotheists and Abraham has his thousands of followers. Why isn't that enough? That does also is not obvious and that's enough. When the Israelites had stayed a long time while in Egypt, they relaxed, learned the practices of their neighbors and like them worshiped idols. Remember, we start the Seder from two places. Both we were slaves and we were idol worshipers. Well, worshipers. When we do that, we were idol worshipers. We go back to Terach, but the Rambam stresses, and there's good proof texts if you want them in the Torah itself, that one of the things that happens in Egypt is that we join them in some of that idol worship. Um, I mean, it's not really obvious, but, it, but the desire to go back, the, the sense that we love the flesh pots of Egypt, the fact that the Israelites so quickly make a golden calf, you might say, well, they're used to idol worship. And that's what the Rambam seems to think, which means on the one hand, they need to return to the doctrine of Abraham. It says the doctrine would have in a short time have been uprooted and Jacob's descendants would have relapsed into the errors and perversities of the nations. But moreover, and this is what I think uh, is the crucial thing that happens next, they need a set of practices that will make this not just an intellectual exercise. But because of God's love for us and because he kept the oath made to our ancestor Abraham, he appointed Moses to be our teacher. So he, again, he is a teacher and he's the teacher of all the prophets and charged him with his mission. Uh, after Moses had begun to exercise his prophetic functions and Israel had been chosen as his heritage, he crowned them with precepts, with commandments, with mitzvot, and showed them the way to worship him and how to deal with idolatry and those who go astray at. So the crucial thing is that Moses adds in commandments that will make this part of our everyday life. So on the one hand, that's an important addition so that we don't just relapse again and fall into a bodhisattva. On the other hand, it suggests that the key is getting away from idolatry and the purpose of the commandments is only to keep us that way, right? So that is not the, they are not in themselves important except in so far as they wean us from idolatry. And of course, for the Rambam, um, if you keep the commandments in an idolatrous way, like treating your mezuzot as if they were magic amulets, you might as well not keep it at all. In that case, you're just committing idolatry. Okay, let's turn to the version of this story in the guide. And the guide I did not put up in Hebrew since it wasn't written in Hebrew. It was written in Arabic, Judeo-Arabic. Uh, What's that? Can I interject? We have a question from the floor yeah. from Robert Gordon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How, how, do you, how do you reconcile this uh, definition of Zazara with the uh, treatment of last week? Whereas all, everything in Rabbi Zazara was related to anger, and your internal Rabbi Zazara. So how does this uh, intersect with that? Good. Uh, that's a question that's supposed to come at the end, Robert, but but look, I think that the Rambam is not interested in that definition. I am going to go back to that definition in, in my own understanding of it. I, I think that the, look, I think I, I, Avodah Zara is puzzling. That's why I'm teaching class on it, right? I, I, what, what's wrong with it? You know, is God really jealous if you bow down to an idol? I mean, the idol can't do anything anyway. There's this, there's this midrash in which Moses says when they make the golden calf to God, um, why are you upset about the calf? He can take half your work from you. You can run the sun, he'll run the moon. And he can do all, half the jobs. And then God says, Moses, there's nothing in this calf. And then Moses says, then why are you jealous of it? Why are you angry with it, right? Mm -hmm. 
what, do we think God is so stupid that I can't tell that, uh, God forbid, <laughs> that God, God couldn't tell that, yeah. um, uh, that these idols don't have anything in them and there's nothing to them? At best, people are being uh, silly in worshiping this. In the paper I've been writing on this, I have a throwaway remark that if my wife was having an imaginary affair with somebody she thought was real, I would look for psychological help for her. I don't think I would. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a bit mysterious. What's up with idolatry? And the rabbis, the Talmud puts up various <laughs> suggestions out. Um, but as usual with the Talmud, it's not a, there's no single coherent idea. Some of them are very powerful and very uh, um, suggestive. And we'll come back to them. The, the Rambam, by contrast, has a very comprehensive idea of what idolatry is, what's wrong with it, and why all of the law is directed against it. I don't think it has much to do with anger. He himself was prone to anger, at least that people he thought were idolatrous. <laughs> I mean, I think he got calmer later in life. But in fact, as he writes to one of his students, uh, yeah, I used to get so mad at all these people who were wrong, and now I'm calm and I don't do this so much. Um, but let's get to what he okay. thinks is wrong with Abodazara. I'm just going to say uh, briefly to you, Robert, he clearly is not taking that up. I don't think there's a way of grafting what he thinks is wrong with Abodazara, at least in any easy way, onto the claims about anger. So, moving a little bit quickly here so we can talk about this. Um, first of all, I'll note the first paragraph here. In the guide, the Rambam constantly says that the world used to be filled with what he calls the Sabaeans, who he had read all about, and that they were idolaters, and they thought that the divine being was the stars and so forth. Uh, the Sabaeans, insofar as they existed at all, were people who inhabited the south of, uh, inhabited what's now Yemen. The Rambam is just wrong that they dominated the entire ancient world, but so he thought. Um, we get, again, the idea that Abraham gets philosophically convinced there must be something beyond the sun, there must be something beyond the stars. So it is a, an argument again. He's convinced that there's a spiritual divine being which is not a body that will be crucial in the Rambam's understanding of what idolatry is, nor a force residing in a body. Um, he therefore began, and, and, and he saw the absurdity of the tales in which he had been brought up. Again, the suggestion that these tales are not just wrong, but somehow stupid, they're absurd. He therefore began to attack the belief of the Sabaeans, to proclaim publicly in opposition to them the name of the Lord, the God of the universe. Um, and skipping down a little bit here, we have shown in our Mishnah Torah, this isn't exactly what he said there, but it's actually a nicer account of it, that Abraham was the first that opposed these theories by arguments and by soft and persuasive speech. Uh, the, I'll call it Shlomo Pines translation, has a very, very different read of that. So I imagine the phrase in Arabic is a little ambiguous, but the idea, it fits with the rest of the context. The idea that what Abraham is, is not just a teacher, but a really good teacher, a gentle teacher who brings people gently into the religion. It's a lovely thought, and it's also a role model. I guess maybe this would connect to what you just asked, Robert. I hadn't thought of this, that he is not an angry teacher that he brings people in gently rather than by uh, railing at them. He induced these people by showing kindness to them to serve God. Afterwards came Moses and completed the work by the commandment to slay, the, the, slay those unbelievers, to blot out the name and uproot them from the land of the living. So these are pretty awful commandments, but the point is that some commandments, including ones to make war on idolaters, at least within the space where the Jewish people were going to live, it's the only place where we have to make war against them. Um, that that complements what Abraham did. That, that again, we saw, though not as explicitly in the Mishnah Torah. Here again, Moses takes the teaching and puts it into a framework of commandments. He forbade us to walk in their ways. Um, and then it says, you know from the repeated declarations in the law that the principal purpose of the whole law was the removal and utter destruction of idolatry and all that is connected therewith. So again, very explicitly here, that's the purpose of the entire law. Okay, so um, let's turn to what idolatry really is for the Rambam and the rather striking um, 
conclusions he draws from his understanding of idolatry. You must know that idolaters, when worshiping idols, do not believe there's no God beside them, and no idolater ever did assume that any image made of metal, stone, or wood has created and governs the heavens and the earth. Again, he does not think that idolatry is actually taking these wooden or metal objects to be gods. He doesn't even think it's the denial of a god. Idolatry is founded on the idea that a particular image represents an intermediary agent between ourselves and God. So the core of idolatry is taking something that is not God between us and God. Kind of like a dead Hasidic God. master. That could be, but it's mostly material things. Yes, that would certainly be included. It's not surprising that my monad. What is surprising is that the uh, uh, Chabad world loves Maimonides so much, but um, yes, and generally Maimonideans don't have any uh, fondness for the whole idea of Hasidic masses or the Kabbalah in general. But here, the crucial thing that I wanted to stress here is, um, so by transferring the prerogative to other beings, they cause the people who notice only the rites, again, the ritual teaches you things here, without comprehending their meaning or their true character of the word being which is worshiped to renounce their belief in the existence of God. So the crucial thing for the Rambam is that by worshiping something with a body, something in between, or something like a star, you forget what God is like. You think that God is connected to material things. You forget that God is simple. You forget that God is a power that is beyond all material things. You think God is invested in the material world. Now, and in fact, I take the punchline basically to be this. How great then must be the offense of him who has a wrong opinion of God himself and believes him to be different from what he truly is. I.e. assumes that he doesn't exist, that he consists of two elements, that he's a corporeal, he has a material, he has a body, that he is subject to external influence or ascribes to him any defect, whatever. Such a person is undoubtedly worse than he who worships idols in the belief that they as agents can do good or evil. So if idolatry is mistake, if worshiping you know, stars or trees or uh, objects made of wood and I uh, iron is a mistake. How much worse it is, says the Ramban, to think God has a body. So thinking God has a body is actually worse than idolatry or it is the ultimate idolatry. Therefore, bear in mind that by the belief in the corporeality of God, which many Jews held before the Rambam came along, and many Jews did afterwards too, saw God as having a hand or somehow being invested in body. By doing that, you provoke God to jealousy and wrath, become his foe, his enemy, in a higher degree than by the worship of idols. After all, if you're an idol worshiper, you're just probably following the minhag avotehem, uh, right? You're, you're, the minhag of your fathers. But if you believe that God has a body, you're making a mistake yourself and you're actually at the heart of denying what God is really like. It's therefore not surprising that even in the Mishnah Torah, he doesn't just, con in the middle of his laws about idolatry, he doesn't just say, condemn idolatry, he condemns any kind of radical heresy. It's not only idolatry to which we must not turn in thought. We are likewise warned not to permit any thought to enter our minds that might cause one to reject a fundamental principle of the Torah. Um, if every man were to follow after the vagaries of his heart, the Rambam sends you imagination, which he sometimes identifies with the heart, leads you astray, the result would be universal ruin. How so? Sometimes one will be drawn to idolatry. Sometimes he will waver in his mind concerning the unity of God. Sometimes he will doubt prophecy. Sometimes he'll doubt whether the Torah has a divine origin or not. All of these things, minute, what he, he calls further down, uh, uh, heresy, these are just like idolatry. And then he quotes, of course, from the last paragraph of the Shema, in this regard, the Torah exhorted us that you not go after your heart nor after your eyes. After your heart refers to heresy, that this does come from the Talmud, minute, after your eyes refers to lechery, to sexual transgression. So the core of idolatry for the Rambam is an intellectual mistake, but it's an intellectual mistake that he thinks is completely corrupting. It's seeing God as bodily or not simple, uh, as invested in the things of this world. 
Now, why is that such a terrible thing? I spent some time worrying about that, but I think the simplest answer, which actually you can get pretty nicely from Moshe Halbertal's book on the Rambam, is that to see God in that way is to be irrational in several ways. First of all, the Rambam simply thinks it's a rational mistake. You're not following the way of truth. You're getting God wrong. But secondly, if God is just a body rather than a power of reason itself, if God is this pure power of reason, then that's what you need to do, be. You need to be as much as possible the reason in yourself. If God is just a body, then, well, first of all, he may be subject to the powers of the universe, but also he could be quite arbitrary. He likes some things, he doesn't like other things. And then the universe is arbitrary. The universe is irrational. Then when God gives us commands, it's just, well, he happens to like this, he doesn't like that. Just like, you know, I don't like olives. Some of you probably like olives. I like chocolate ice cream, I don't like vanilla ice cream. So maybe God doesn't want us to eat pork because he just doesn't really like pork. Or uh, he just wants to see us listen to him. A God like that would be an arbitrary God and would encourage us to be arbitrary rather than rational. And I think that's the key here. The core of worship of God is raising our reason to its highest level. And all of the commands for the Rambam, I and mean, he does understand them this way, are meant to subdue our attraction to our bodily inclinations and draw us to our reason. And that's isn't there some, all the commands are struggle against idolatry. Yes, isn't there some danger in the Ashaya Leibovich David Blythe philosophy of just shut up and do it that leads to that? Okay, so that's interesting. Um, next week is uh, Leibovitz, um, all Leibovitz. Leibovitz thinks that he's just saying what Maimonides is saying. I don't think so. I think there's an important difference. Uh, and in fact, the difference has to do crucially with reason. For the Rambam, and in this sense, he's actually you know, following his master Aristotle or his masters, Aristotle and Plato. Um, the goal of our life is to develop our reason to its fullest extent. That's what God wants us to do. Insofar as we do that, we merge with God to some extent, or at least we, we approach God as closely as we can. And all the commands are in that sense rational. They have a purpose. Even the Chukim have a purpose, although we don't fully understand what they are, um, what the purpose is. Um, but we have to, it's in some sense the opposite of Leibovitz, and we'll actually look at a, a passage in which I think this comes out in Leibovitz, uh, because for the Rambam, just shut up and do it is the wrong attitude. For Leibovitz, there's a rational purpose. This is gonna reach, uh, let, let us reach our highest level. That's idolatry. So in some sense, what is idolatry for Leibovitz is the highest human purpose for the Rambam, what is, um, idol what is the highest religious act for Leibovitz is idolatry for the Rambam. It's not obvious, it's a subtle difference. And, uh, and Leibovitz will, sometimes refers to the Rambam as uh, the greatest Jew since Moses. I mean, I don't think just sometimes, that's exactly what he thought. And he does say it explicitly at least once. Um, and Leibovitz, I think, thinks that he is just following out the Rambam, but I don't think he is. There's an ex the Rambam is a thoroughgoing rationalist, and Leibovitz is an existentialist, and that's really so, different. Well, I'd, I'd say Rambam's a wannabe thoroughgoing. I mean, I, I, I can't stand Rambam <laughs> myself. I think he's, 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 he's just way too en en enchanted with his own intellect and wants to project intellectualism on the whole world as the way to be. He was the smartest guy in the room wherever he went, and he elevates <laughs> that into the, into, the, into the way to be close to God, which is sort of like saying, uh, yeah. and, 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 and the, the ludicrous of this is, is sort of shown by his predicating this whole, on these almost childish midrashic stories about the nature of how human thought evolved and developed. And I, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's very frustrating to me to see this elevation of, of and, 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 and he fancies himself intellectual, but he's predicating it all on certain very non-rational um, bases and, and assumptions about history and the nature of the world and the nature of, of, of 
of history, and, and he has no sense of those limitations, it seems. I well, don't know. It's very frustrating to me to learn Rambam. I, 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 I just always react very negatively to him. So um, I, don't, I don't totally disagree, shall I say. Um, and indeed, on a, uh, my own view, the Rambam, while being a very powerful critic of idolatry in good ways, also, I think, has a kind of ideological idolatry. Um, but I'm going to defend him, especially because that's my role tonight, especially. <laughs> Let me hear it. Let me hear it. You'll restore my faith. <laughs> well, I'm not sure I will fully. Um, look, first of all, just on a very basic level, the Rambam thinks if you really have completely misunderstood what God is, then when you say you're worshiping God, you're not worshiping God. You're worshiping someone else. And th that's, that's the point we, I think we have to accept. I mean, look, if you think God is an elephant or you think God, I mean, for us, you think God is uh, Jesus or you think God is a uh, blue guy in some in Hindu country, you know, that's not God as we understand. Um, and obviously you could just make mistakes that would be, um, that really would make you, you might me think you, you're worshiping God, but you're not. Now, secondly, at a minimum, a rational God is a God who presumably wants us to be rational with one another and wants us to respect other rational beings. That's to say, when, if you see, I mean, it's not an exact coming together, but basically a rational God is a moral God. I mean, it's may, maybe that's not all of morality, but uh, it's generally been rationalists who have stressed human rights, who have stressed the need to respect each other's ability, everybody's ability to make their own decisions. The Rambam's been very influential on the uh, sort of a liberal Jewish tradition in that sense. I mean, I don't, a liberal with a small L, I don't mean politically in a sense, except in the sense of respecting, you know, kind of Kantian tradition, respecting everybody's freedom and respecting all human beings as equal insofar as we're capable of reasoning and so forth. And indeed, one of the things that goes with that is that Rambam's conception of the law is uh, non-magical and not given to setting up any kind of elite to rule over the rest of us. So Jonathan made that remark about, um, you know, Hasidic leaders who can be venerated in a semi-idolatrous way. Any kind of elite that would be treated as superior in nature to other human beings, including an elite of Jews vis-a-vis of, of, -vis the rest of the world, the Rambam is opposed to. And in that sense, what about an intellectual also, elite? Wouldn't, what? Wouldn't there be, wouldn't he be advocating an intellectual elite? It's just an elite that he's the, in charge of. Hmm. Well, except that this one, it's some, and then Hello? Here, here, Hello? I, yeah? Uh, this is Helen. I'm on I'm the sorry. phone. I'm not on the, on the iPad. When you finish, I would like to contribute something. <laughs> yes, sure. Let me just add one more line okay. to uh, Michael. Okay. Um, okay. Actually, two more lines, and then I will stop. The first one is this. Um, the Rambam is very insistent that Jewish leaders, Jewish prophets, that includes Moses, need to be humble and need to see that, need never to be acting for their own power. There are, there are various things a prophet has to divest themselves of. They have to be a philosopher, but they also have to divest themselves of lust, material, of sexual lust, but, uh, greed, but also political lust. So in that sense, he's very explicit about the role of the leadership has to be one that serves the community and not that serves the leader. And that I think is actually one of the best pieces from the Rambam. The second thing is, he's quite pluralist about Jews and non-Jews. He very much does welcome in, uh, it, there's no racial element as there is sometimes in Halevi about his conception of who the Jews are. We're here to serve the rest of the world. Anyone who comes in and wants to jo join us, especially if, uh, 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 if they uh, accept the whole Torah, but I mean, he has that wonderful, you know, letter, as you know, to Avadia, the proselyte, but even if they just renounce idolatry, he's welcoming. And there's something about the rationalist conception of, uh, of God, I think, that can be welcomed in a way that non-rationalists can. Sorry, yes, the person who's on the phone. Uh, yes, this is Helen, and yes. um, in France, in a cave, 
from prehistoric times, there's a little statue of a lion man. And it looks like it was caressed and kind of rubbed out. And this is the first evidence that human beings saw the elusive idea of some kind of a power in the universe. Now, I'm going to ask a couple of things. Is that really wrong? The first imagination of a, some kind of creator? Then the second thing that the Rambam is saying that Abraham gathered all the believers. Well, Lot doesn't seem to be a poster boy for <laughs> believing. And then the third thing, we have the prayer on Shabbat. Yitzoram Badas, the Vina Ufas Kale. So are we wrong in investing so much Bina in Haskel into the planets? So those are my three questions. <laughs> so the Rambam clearly seems to think, well, yes, on the one hand, actually worshiping a sun god or any kind of figure is absolutely out for the Rambam. But he, on the other hand, he, do, he does stress that uh, idolaters, he doesn't think, worship the figures themselves. They are worshiping God through the figures. I think this is partly because it, he's more interested in criticizing fellow Jews than he is in criticizing non <laughs> Um He wants to say, oh, yeah, those among us who think, oh, we're so superior to the others because we don't have idols. Well, if we, you believe in a corporeal God, you're just as bad or worse. Right. So I don't think, I mean, yes, he thinks it's wrong, but I don't know how harsh he would be about it. And certainly insofar as they're worshiping the creator through it, I think that would be fine. Uh, second to your question about Lot, look, I mean, the Ramban is, uh, this is, I think, part of Mike's uh, concern with him. He's, he's pretty much making up the history as he goes along here. Um, <laughs> It's not exactly the history you find in the Tanakh. I don't know if Lot is supposed to be a hero here or not. Uh, I forgot the third one. Trump it off, you know, the scale. Oh. Um, we we any, don't ask him. Yeah, anything that might smack of astrology in our own system is clearly not okay for the Rambam. Um, there are, he is, he is an una, he's unabashed, this is also a thing I like about him, Mike, he's unabashed about being willing to criticize the halakhic system when he thinks it goes wrong. He has an idea and he wants to pursue it. We may not agree with him, maybe it's too rationalist, but he is a model. It, it's, it's wonderful that he's such a great figure in the formation of halakha. He is a model for how you can really absorb halakha, but also be internally critical of it. Um, Yes. I got one more, one more no, thing. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh. I sorry. There's someone else who wants to ask a question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, um, I wanted to address what Mike was saying about intellectual kind of superiority. Kind of, I remember when I learned Morenovuk, and I learned it 60, 55 years ago with Professor Alexander Altman. Oh, wow. White. Awesome. Yeah. That was a privilege. But I remember him telling us, and what Michael said rang very true to me, because what he said was that the Rambam saw, I don't know, because he'd go like this, and he had a bald head, that it was through the intellect that you became closer to God, and that the more developed your intellect was, the more you had a direct connection with God, and there was the philosopher prince who was the highest level who, because his the intellect was so developed, so that does smack of what Mike's talking about. I would think. I, oh, I, mean, well, I can't really remember that. I can't give you quotes, but I remember him talking about that. So I, look, I, I don't at all mean to deny that the Ramam's an elitist. You, you can't possibly deny that he's very much an elitist. And that really only a person with a great intellect is going to reach. Well, but there I want to add a qualification. There's a beautiful section at the end of the guide in which he describes, he has a huge me a, a metaphor, very extended metaphor about God as a kind of a king in a palace 
Yeah. But there are some people who are facing the other direction. They have no idea what the palace is at all. And then there are some people on the other end who are very close, who are in the king's presence. Those are the people with the most developed intellects and it's this elite and so forth. But in between, there are a lot of people, and that's supposed to be the everyday Jew who's pious, who's not quite in the inner chamber, but they are around the palace and they get something of the aura of the king. And I think the Rambam, and look, he lives in an, uh, he lives in an elitist age and he's taking on an elitist philosophy. He, he is at the same time quite understanding and in many ways um, often kind and generous in his halakhic opinions to the ordinary Jew who wants to worship God. Um, there are things that he thinks we, the ordinary Jew shouldn't do like treat um, halacha as a source of magic or something like that. That's really bad to get that out. But the ordinary Jew whose intellect only goes so far and no further can still have a connection to God. The point is each of us has to stretch our intellect as far as we can go. And those with the greatest intellect need to lead the others. But again, it's not for the sake of our own pleasure. It's not for the sake of the philosopher prince. And this uh, you can take from Plato also who says that philosopher king is not supposed to just celebrate himself. He's supposed to lead the rest of the city. And that's very much in the Rambam, I think, that the, that the job of those with the greatest intellect is to help everyone else bring their minds as close as possible to God. And so I guess I, 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 I'll use this as, a, as, a, as a, a way of closing in a way. Another thing I like about the Rambam, for all the things I don't like, is, you know, however much you may overstress <laughs> Don't we want to think that for most, most human beings value what they can do with their minds? Maybe it's not, for many people, it's not philosophy, right? But we don't want to say, oh, well, you're too dumb, just work with your hands, right? Uh, we, we, we're not gonna develop your minds. It, it's a great gift to help people develop their minds as much as possible. So he may overstress that, but in his respect for human intellect, he has a broad respect for humanity generally. I think that's also why he's open in the sense of, uh, you know, not sort of close to, to Jews alone and so forth. So, I mean, there's a lot to, there are limits to the Ramban. It is overly intellectual, but there are also some ways in which I think it goes in a positive direction. Sam, I wanted to- How does the Rambam say that, um, I, I, how can a rational God be jealous and have those kind of emotions? It works much better you know, when you when you have a corporal God, then then the... right. He thinks jealousy is just a metaphor for righteous anger. Um, mm -hmm. Quickly, Jonathan and Robert or uh, Elliot, should we call it off? What's a no? Um, I just wanted to ask a question. Um, yeah. Which is, I was struck when you were doing the text, the Rambam, uh, where he talks about um, problem with intermediaries to God. Right. And it struck me that. He, he's not saying that's a category or that that's something inherently wrong. It's that it will lead you to have these other thoughts, beliefs, practices, which are problematic. So it's not inherently right. a problem, right? Rambam says they're angels and, and other celestial beings. The problem is we shouldn't be looking to the angels to intervene on our behalf or pray that the angels then pray on our behalf. And it reminded me of, of his comment about what the problem um, with Enosh was, which was not that it was inherently a problem to praise the, the stars and the celestial beings, but what it would lead to. So, right. so is it really just, or is it really then just uh, a slippery slope problem for Rambam as opposed to like an inherent error? Um, not just that. That's why I went back to this text here. When, when he presents in the guy, when he presents Abraham as arguing with the Sabaeans, um, they think that the sun is, you know, directing things. And he says, you're right. The sun acts in the same manner as the ax in the hand of him that hews with it. That's to say, everything less than God is ultimately controlled by God. And if you worship the intermediary, you have lost the importance of God is transcending everything else, right? So you stopped, and if you stop, you, you lose God altogether, right? You have to see, every, the other things may be wonderful, they may have their roles, they are these sort of intermediaries, but you have to see them as intermediaries. If you forget that they are the tools of God, you forget who God is. 
So my comment fits right onto that. I see a lot of what you said as a polemic against Christianity. I think that's a little less likely with the Rambam than with some other people because he doesn't care about Christianity that much. He lives so strongly in a Muslim world. He doesn't care much of Christianity. Um, he's, he, unlike many other halachists, he thinks Christianity is clearly a Zara, while Islam is not. Um, but he doesn't know much about it either, and it's not an, not an immediate threat. It's, it, it's not a major thing. I think he thinks about Christianity the way Jews until, let's say, the creation of the State of Israel thought about Islam. It's like, not really, I don't really care too much about that. It's just, <laughs> uh, so incidentally, you're right, Robert, he's opposed to Christianity, but I don't think it's a main object of what he's doing. There's a certain irony in that too, because when he says that wrong conceptions of God are the great, great sin, to me, it sounds very Christian. It's like, if you don't believe in Jesus, that's the biggest sin of all. It's like, you just accept Jesus and you're good, which I've always found a very difficult belief to even wrap my head around. Right. It's almost, like he's, a, it's almost like he's giving a, he's going down that path himself. Except that for Christians, you can come to that belief in Jesus only via faith right? Yeah. And Gospels. It has to be preached to you. For the Rambam, and I think this is what's maybe, I, I hope it wasn't too long that I went through the stories that he tells about the role of Abraham. It's pretty clear that you can come to God through, through reason. Um, everyone can come to it. You don't need, you don't need the Torah. You don't need to hear about it from Moshe. I mean, for other Jews, you wouldn't say that, but for the Rambam, we can all get there. And that, I think, makes it a little bit less of an imposition. You might not agree with him. I'm not sure I do. But if you do agree with him, it's a little bit less of an imposition. I think. Well, you know, one of the ironies Two here quick is notes. The, the Avram story is so clearly based on the story of Gidon. And where Gidon is, you know, you, Gidon is told yeah, by God to destroy his father's idols. And he goes and destroys his father's idols. And then the father defends Gidon when everyone comes to kill him for destroying the idols. And the father says, it, the, the line that's put in Avraham's letter, the father says, well, if you guys want to kill my son for destroying the, 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 the idols, why don't, why don't you just go for the Baal God? Because Baal should be able to defend himself. If Baal can't defend himself, then Baal's not really a God. And, and that story is so strikingly similar with very material differences, but Gidon comes to it because he sees an angel. There's no hint of intellectualism there. And that exactly. story of Abraham is so clearly, in my mind at least, so clearly based on the story of Gidon. Except that that's not, that story plays only a secondary role in the Rambam story, um, what the Rambam wants to say about Abraham. It's a midrash, and it's a midrash that reappears in the Quran. I think this would be actually interesting to do someday. I'll take you on if you want to do it, and Mike, we can do a joint session on the Quran, the midrash, and the story of Gidon. <laughs> Meanwhile, I actually have to get to another discussion group, so I'm sorry to cut this short, but I'm glad everybody uh, will be enjoying it. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, quick thank comment. You very much. Much. Thank you very much, and we'll be back next week uh, to learn more on the topic in Yeshayahu yeah. Leibowitz, which uh, should be extremely interesting for all. Thank you. Yeshayahu, thank you. Okay. Thank you.